Perhaps you remember the famous poetic words of Robert Frost. And he wrote, two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. See, Robert Frost is trying to teach us poetically that we all face roads, divergences in the roads, proverbial forks in the road, as it were. And the road that we choose, the road we choose to go down, to live our lives by, truly will make all the difference. Matthew 28 is not a story about two roads per se, but really two stories. And the divergence that takes place there is not in a wood or even it is in a garden, and it's near a tomb. And the story that you take to be your story of the two stories in this passage will certainly make all the difference in your life as well. Competing roads, competing narratives. It really is nothing new to people who live in our culture and our society today. Now, we have numerous divergences, really, that take place and have taken place all from the beginning of time, even till now. I mean, truly, the author was right when I read this week. There is no narrativeless history. Everything in life tells a story, including Adam and Eve. And from the very beginning, humanity had to choose which road they would go down, which story they would live by. Adam and Eve chose whether it was God's story or the devil's story. And practically, you could say, as you look over the widespread of history, is that every war... And every hostility has come as a result of divergent stories, disagreements on what the life story is really all about. The revolutionary war between the colonies and Britain about what is freedom, whether civil war in America and the North versus the South about the issue of slavery, or whether it's Israel or Palestine in the recent days that we are in, and the stories of the promised land and who should really own it and live in it. See, they're all stories. They're all about different narratives. Creation versus evolution. They're just two different origin stories. Scientific stories, whether the earth is the center of our solar system or the sun is. We had to define that out. Political stories in our world today. Elections are coming up. The divide of the two stories between Republican or Democrat. There are moral stories being told in our culture Abortion, two stories of personhood, two stories about a woman's body and her rights and what constitutes life. Daily divergences, truthfully, daily ones that we all face, choices that we make every single day. And truly, those choices, small ones and great ones, will make all the difference. But none of them that I've mentioned this morning so far, as important as they are, compared to the choice of the meta story, the big story of life. And by that I mean this, the story that puts all the other stories or makes sense of all the other stories. That's what lies before us in Matthew 28. It's about telling what life is about. And there are two choices, as always, in the Bible. And today I would like you to see these two stories side by side in Matthew's gospel as your own personal divergence from where you will decide where your life goes. It won't be in a wood or in a garden and not necessarily even in a church, although we're here today. The real divergence, personally for you, will take place inside of you. It's a choice that you're going to make today before you leave this building on Easter about the story that you believe is true, the one that you will live in, because it will make all the difference, both now and for eternity in your life. So we're going to take a look at the two Easter stories that are written in our text, and we are going to see what they each say about Easter, and more importantly, what they say about life, because one of these stories is God's story of Easter. It is the story that comes from heaven. We're going to find that out. And then there's the other story. It's a man's story, completely by man, completely only on an earth story. And these two stories are different renditions of the same story. There are not two stories here ultimately today. One story, but different responses to it. And the choice that you make today will make a difference forever in your life. Competing narratives. Now, we all know competing narratives maybe in a more simple way. 
to make it obvious to you. Even today, there's the competing story of Jesus and even the Easter Bunny. You can laugh at that. It's okay. I heard a story this week about a man who was driving down the road, and he was thinking about the stories. And he was driving along just having a great time, and all of a sudden, he just caught out of the peripheral vision. He saw something cross the road, and he tried to stop. He didn't want to hit it, but he couldn't help himself. He couldn't put the brakes on fast enough, and he slammed into what turned out to be a bunny. And the bunny had a basket in his hand, and when he hit the bunny, you know, the chocolates and the eggs, they just sprue all over the road, everywhere. He got parked the car on the side of the road. He gets out, and he runs up, and he can't believe it. He can't believe it that he hit the Easter bunny. And all the stuff's everywhere, and he doesn't know what to do. He's thinking to himself, oh, no, how can this happen? I think I've killed the Easter bunny. I've ruined everybody's story for this weekend. And so he doesn't know what to do. And there he looks at the bunny's life, and it, you know, it's, he's, his body lays still. It's not even moving. So a lady is driving by, and she sees this man really leaning over this bunny on the side of the road, and he's crying. So she stops on the side of the road, and she runs up to him. She goes, what has happened? What is going on? He goes, you're not going to believe this. It's the worst thing that could ever have happened. I think I hit the Easter bunny, and I've killed him. She goes, oh, my, that is terrible. And then she paused for a moment. She goes, wait, wait, wait. I think I have something that can help. I can save this. So she runs back to her car. She opens the door, and she goes in the back seat, and she pulls out this can. And she runs over to the bunny, the Easter bunny, and she sprays all over him. And within a matter of seconds, a miracle. The bunny gets up, and he's alive as ever. He starts hopping around, picks up the Easter packet, puts the eggs and the chocolate back inside, and off he goes, hopping down the road and the highway. Every 50 feet, he turns around, and he waves at them. They can't believe The guy is amazing. He doesn't know what to say. You know, 50 more feet down the road, turns and waves back at them. Everything is fine. He keeps doing that, back, wave until he's out of sight. And the guy is, goes, I can't believe that this is the greatest thing ever. He goes, what happened? What in the world was in that can? And she goes, it was hairspray. <laughs> and she says, look, read on the can. The can says this, restores dead hair to life and adds a permanent wave. See, that's a competing narrative. And you laugh at that because, Pastor Walker, that story doesn't compete. <laughs> I get that. But listen, I'm hoping by the end of my message today that you'll see the other story, the one side by side in the Bible, and you'll be able to say, Pastor Walker, that other story really doesn't compete. You know why? Because like the bunny story, it isn't real. It isn't real. You see, today I want to look at and unpack two stories. That's all. I want to look at God's Easter story and man's Easter story. The two stories do not begin with once upon a time, and they don't end with they live happily ever after, because those are words that come from fictional stories. But this is a non-fictional story. This is a historical account of eyewitnesses who are actually there and experience these stories firsthand for themselves. See, they are two stories. And the point of the story is that there's a, div a divergent, and they go opposite di directions, not only physically, but spiritually. See, one of these two stories comes to us from heaven. One of the stories comes from us on earth. See, they are origin stories in and of themselves. One is from heaven and one is from earth. One is true and one is false. And although they have the same facts in them, they couldn't be any different than what they are. It's traumatic, actually, because the text says, and if you read the whole chapter, you'd realize that the word behold, and it's a word that always in the Bible is used to get your attention. And they want to draw your attention six times in this chapter. The word behold is four times in God's Easter story, and only one time really borrowed from God's story to introduce man's story. Because all the drama and all the reality is really in the first story. And Matthew wants you to do this. Focus on the first story because it's the true story of Easter. And that true story is evidenced in ways that most people, especially in the first century, would have never, ever realized. 
there are a number of events there that tell about the veracity of the first story, Jesus' story, God's story. The first is this. The witnesses, the first witnesses to Easter, portrayed in our video today, were women. And you say, what does that mean? Well, they're not just women. They're women who are named. Two Marys, Joanna, and other Gospels. When you put them all together, all the first witnesses were women. Now, in first century Judaism, women's testimonies were not valid in court. They were not legally binding, and they had no weight. Because that's the position that women had at that time in that culture. Women's testimonies were not valid. Especially women, named women, who had very questionable pasts. Mary Magdalene, who's the key witness, as portrayed again today on our video, her name, Mary Magdalene, she had a woman, the Bible says, that Jesus cast out seven demons out of her. Some even historical accounts say that she was a prostitute. So her past, you would think, if you're going to show Jesus is really alive, you wouldn't pick people, and you wouldn't put women in the story, and you wouldn't put named women who have that kind of past if you wanted people to actually believe the story. And then on top of that, the actual men who actually witness not actually Jesus rising from the dead, but are told the report, his own disciples... The men in the story, they don't even believe it. Why? You have to ask the question, why? Why would Matthew write a story and make it so incredibly difficult for first century people to buy it? You know why? Because it's true. See, there's no glamorizing of the Easter story. In fact, Matthew starts out his book giving Jesus' genealogy. And in that day, no one put women in anyone's genealogy. There was no women. Jesus has four women in his genealogy. Two of them are Gentiles. One is a prostitute. Why? Why does Matthew do that? From the beginning of the book and at the end of the book. You know why? Because he wants you to know this. It's true. Nobody would put these stories in the way that they're in here unless it was true. Second of it, earthquakes. It's the Greek word we get seismos, seismology. It's the study of earthquakes. Why? Why earthquakes? Because the first story wants to tell you this, that God from heaven is breaking into humanity in history. In fact, if you read the text carefully, you'll see that there are two earthquakes taking place. One in Matthew 27 verse 51 at the cross and one in our text, in verse 2, at the tomb. Why? Two major events. You know why? Because God in his sovereignty is controlling not all the people, only the people in the story, but all the events. He even controls the world itself. And he's bringing it all together because Matthew wants to tie together this, that God is shaking up not only the ground, but humanity. He is shaking up people's lives because not man... But he, God, is in sovereign. He is in control, not only of these events, but all of history. Because as one writer said, history is his story. God alone is writing the story of Easter and all of Jesus' life. And truthfully, yours as well, if you have eyes to see it. Third event, an angel comes down. Why put the angel's appearance in the story? Why spend so much time on it? Why tell us what the angel did? Why can't we just say an angel came and he said these words to them and then he disappeared? The Bible says in the first couple of verses that the angel appeared and his appearance was like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. And then it says that he rolled the stone away and then, strangely enough, he sat on it. Why is that? Well, you know Anybody who has white clothes that are so bright and white as snow, they are those who have been in God's presence. Again, Matthew wants you to know this isn't just a man's version. This is God's version. And God has sent his messengers, and he's reflecting his glory through these angels. And what does he want you to get from the angels? Well, when they sit on top of the tomb, all throughout Matthew's gospel, anytime you sit down, you are showing and demonstrating you have authority. Do you get the picture of what the Easter story is about? Man thinks they have authority over Jesus by crucifying him, securely putting him in a tomb, putting Caesar's seal on it, putting guards. See, they think they have authority and power. 
man's story thinks that they have one up on God. But the reality is far different. I find it interesting. Not only do they tell about the angels, like lightning, it says, like snow. But then it compares to the guards. You know what the guards are like? Like dead men. It's ironic, isn't it? See, God's appearance, the angel's appearance, and the men's appearance. You know, the only time in all of Scripture, other than this verse, that says the phrase, like dead men, is Isaiah 59.10. And it describes, we grope for the wall like blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. In other words, you look like you can see, you look like you have energy, you look like you have life, but the truth is you're blind and you're dead. You see, the stories and how they are written are not just to teach us about physical things. Listen, they're telling us about the types of people are in both types of stories. Do you see what he's saying? See, the women, they are seeking Jesus, but the men, the guards, they are not. The one is alive The other is dead. Did you ever see this passage and think this? Living men become like dead men, and the dead man, Jesus, becomes alive. At every turn, at every point in this Easter story, Matthew is trying to tell us that it's completely different than the next one. That one is about death when they think they have life, and one is about life when they think they have death. You see, God's story shakes us. Did you notice in the text, if you look again with me, in verses 3 and 4, the guards and the women were both afraid, and you would be too. If an angel came this morning, (laughs) you and I would be afraid. But the angel does not say to the soldiers, do not fear. But he does say it to the women. Why? Because the goal of being afraid of God is not death, but faith. He wants to believe. He wants your fear to lead to faith. In fact, I would go so far as to say this morning that the only way that you can ever face the fears in your life is that when you believe God's Easter story and put your faith and trust in Christ. Case in point, in verse 4, it says, the guards, when they saw the angel, trembled. In English, it means to be afraid. And Greek, it means to have an earthquake. It's the same word used for earthquake in verse 2 is the word tremble in verse 4. See, it wasn't just a geographical earthquake that was taking place. It was a personal earthquake. The soldiers were shaking literally inside and out because there was no one in their life from heaven telling them that they didn't have to be afraid. See, they had to be afraid. But unlike them, the women, see, the angel says, you don't have to be afraid. Why? The difference is because you're seeking Jesus. And having Jesus in your life and having his words in your life changes everything. Don't be afraid is only used three times in Matthew's gospel. Two times, five and ten of our chapter. And the only other time is when Jesus is walking on the water. And he comes to the disciples and he says, don't be afraid. You know why? Because... Jesus can handle all of our life quakes. All of them, no matter what form they think, they they come in our life. Fearlessness does not come from the absence of danger, but the presence of deity. That's why God at the tomb gives to the angel and Jesus a double dose of fearlessness to his followers, his women at the tomb Because he wants them to know that he is there. You say, Pastor Walker, what about Jesus? What is it about him that dispels our fears? Well, the verse tells us in verses 5 and 6, here it is. He was crucified, but he is risen. Was crucified, is risen. That's the power and authority that he has. Jesus can tell you this morning, no matter what you're facing, no matter what fears are taking place in your life, he can tell you this, don't be afraid. And it's not craziness. It's not just idle words, it's reality. And you know why? Because his story is the gospel story. And the gospel story has taken and conquered our greatest life shake of all, 
death itself. I looked on the internet this week, and I looked up the Richter scale for earthquakes. And it's really divided by levels, and there are 10 levels. And each time you go up a number, the level goes stronger and stronger. Levels 1 through 4 are pretty much all the same. They are small daily quakes, barely noticeable by most people. In fact, almost no one will ever notice that they're happening. But they happen, truthfully, the, the, the uh, article said, every minute of every day, all week long, all year long. And they're like for us, life quakes. They're like small sicknesses. You have a cold, a sore throat. Kids are acting up a little more than normal today. Minor argument with your spouse. That's level one through four life quakes. But the Richter scale goes up. And levels five through six are called moderate. And they happen less often, but they're more severe. They're monthly. And maybe only every 10 years would one of these take place. But the word that describes them on the Richter scale is strong suddenly. They're not things that we were ready for. A little stronger than what we thought. Maybe like for us, surgery, loss of a job, rocky relationships, financial struggles, moderate life quakes. And then you have level seven. It's called major, monthly, every 10 years, strong, sudden, and then they add this, severe. Been shaken by those? They include divorce, chronic pain that not even the pills will take away, loss of loved ones, people that were near and dear to your life, suddenly, severely gone. But the Richter scale even goes higher. Eight and nine, the level's called great. Not because it is great, but because it's so large in magnitude. They only happen maybe yearly, every hundred years. More severe is the description. Disease comes to you. The the cancer diagnosis from the doctor isn't somebody else that you've heard of. It's yours. Emotional chaos out of control. Lifelong dreams ruined, completely ruined. Things you thought would never happen actually happened. That's level eight and nine. And only one remains, really. Only one that supersedes and extends beyond all of the preceding ones. Level 10, and it's called super. Rarely it's described. Every 1,000 years, extreme rarity. The article said, once in a lifetime. For us, that kind of life quake is death. You got the shakes lately? I wouldn't be surprised. Because the story that you choose will make all the difference, both now and for eternity. And so there are some who say to themselves, and maybe it's you this morning, well, I think I can handle levels one through four. I mean, they're not that shaky. I've gone through levels one through four often, and we have. And maybe five and six you put is not too far off out of your range to handle. You can work through it on your own, your own wisdom, your own strength. But then you hit a level seven event, much tougher, lasts longer. And then, despite your disbelief, eight and nine comes, and it becomes out of the question, not just strong, not just sudden, not even just severe, but over the top. You're not ready for a seismic situation of that degree. And then level 10. My sister Molly, when she was eight, started getting bruises on her body. And they wouldn't go away. In fact, if you touched her skin hard enough, she'd get more of them. She fell down and the bruises were way bigger and more widespread on her body than would be normal for anyone else. And we knew something was wrong. So my mom and dad took her to the doctor, and the doctor says that she has a rare blood disease. And no longer is, you know, she's not any longer capable of protecting herself. She cannot have anyone really touch her. She cannot fall down. She can't have any accidents. She cannot be in recess. 
She can't do anything. She really can't have anyone else really all that near her at all unless they know how to be extremely careful because one wrong accident could kill her in a matter of minutes. My parents didn't know what to do with that level seven or eight or whatever you would call it. But then they realized, yes, we do. And I remember as a young man, my parents called our pastor and he came over. I remember very vividly seeing my pastor and my dad on their knees in our garage begging for mercy and kindness because the doctor said this, you must go home and take the best care of you can because there is no treatment. 80% of everyone who gets this disease lives, which means 20% do not. <laughs> there was nothing they could do. But for my mom and dad, they lived in God's story, and they knew there was nothing the doctors could do, but there was everything that God could do. You know why? Because Jesus' power and his authority as he raised from the dead, is greater than any power there is that man even knows. Thankfully, in time, my daughter Molly, my, my daughter, my sister Molly, my parents' daughter, she recovered. And God showed strength and power in ways that we didn't deserve. I remember that. I read an article this week. The U.S. is underprepared for earthquakes. Top three markets for earthquakes if you live in California, Washington, and Missouri. The article said this, despite experiencing 90% of all of America's earthquakes, only 10% of people in California ever get insurance. And the article said, to their own demise. 90% of all the earthquakes are in California. Only 10% of people get insurance. And you say, that is crazy. Is it? A hundred percent of everyone in this room today will face the greatest, most severe life quake that you could possibly face, death. Every single one of us. But how many this morning in here are assured, even to the smallest degree, that when you face death, that you'll have eternal life? Crazy, isn't it? Maybe the article should read, the world is unprepared for life quakes especially eternity. How can Easter Pastor Walker prepare me? How can it prepare me for death, the ultimate life quake? Because Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection is the gospel story. Only he can handle all of life's life quakes. Interesting, in Matthew 8, 24, when Jesus was asleep in the boat and the storm was swamping the boat and they thought they were going to die, the storm is called a mega seismos. It's a storm, but it's called a seism. I mean, it's called the same word we use for earthquake. You know what it means? Jesus can handle any storm. He can handle storms on the water about your life. He can handle stories about the grave and your death and everything in between. That's what Easter means. It means that no matter if it's a life quake, an earthquake, a sin quake, a hell quake, he's conquered all of them, do you see? That is why his story is the true one, the real one. He's given us a life that we can have without fear. In fact, the Bible says in our text that the women went away from the tomb with fear and great joy. How do you go from mega earthquake to mega joy? The only way possible for you, no matter what level you're at today, is if you know Jesus. I'm convinced the story you live in is the story that you will live by. The story that you believe will be the story that you behave. And the way that you respond to, respond to life quakes today is because of which story that you have chosen to live in. Before we take a look at the man's story for just two minutes or so and we'll be done, I want to tell you something crucial about this text. It's not two stories that are different from one another. It is the same story the soldiers tell the religious leaders, is the same one the women tell the disciples. The difference is the interpretation of it. The difference is the response of it. If you looked at and took time, as I did this week, at all the grammar in the text, you will find in both stories the same words are repeated. 
about what is said, about going and telling people. And while they were going, all of the words are the same. And Matthew wants you and I, as we finish this sermon today, to do this. He wants you to think about the two stories in contrast. The one from heaven, the one from earth. The one that is God's, the one is man's. The one that is true and one is false. And he wants you to say this, which one am I going to live in? They are the same story. The facts are the same. But how you read them, interpret them, and apply them are radically different. Have you ever had a text from somebody, and it was a group text, and you read it one way, and everybody, someone else read it the other? You say, it's the same text. I got this email. Oh, I did too. What did you think? Oh, I thought it was great. I thought it was terrible. Have you ever thought that you watched a movie? What did you? Oh, I really love that movie. Oh, that was the worst movie ever. I love that restaurant. That food is so good. That restaurant reeks. Have you ever had that? Well, see, that's just a difference of opinion. That's not what's happening in our text. This is not just a misunderstanding. Can I say it? This is a purposely different interpretation. As one author said, it is a calculated deception. The irony is, the reason that they asked Pilate for a guard at the tomb was because they said that Jesus was a deceiver. Pastor Jim stands right there, gives his line, this deceiver in our program tonight. It's the word in Matthew actually means imposter. Jesus was a fake. He was a liar. He was phony. And the word deception is used in 27, 63, and 64. And here's why he's a fake, because he's planning to have his disciples steal his body. What a liar, they said. And we don't want to see that lie perpetuated. <laughs> you know what the irony is? The deception that they used to perpetuate their story was the same one they said the disciples would do. When he tells the guards, here's what you're going to do. Go tell them that the disciples came at night while you were asleep and stole the body. That's the one they said that Jesus was going to do. But they're the ones who use that very deception themselves. That's man's story. See, it's a divergence. Verse 11, and while they were going, the women were running to tell the disciples the good news. The guards were running to tell the religious leaders the bad news. And those two stories in the text go like this. Why? Because you have to choose. Who are you going to run with? Who are you going to run toward, he says. See, the Roman guards were in trouble because they had an earthquake, a real one, and now they're going to have a life quake of even greater magnitude. Here's why. When Pilate assigns a group of soldiers to Jesus' tomb, it would have been a 16-man unit. We portray it with a few soldiers. They would have had 16. And here's what I read in history and what the Quaterna, is what it's called, 16 men do. They have strict rules. Each guard is always responsible for six square feet of space. That's all. That small area and anything and anyone who comes in that space. They cannot sit down on their assignment. They cannot even lean against anything. If you fall asleep while you're on duty, you will be taken and beaten publicly, and then you will be killed and buried in your uniform. Also, if you fall asleep on duty, not only you will die, but because of your incompetence or neglect, every single one of the remaining 15 guys in your unit will also be killed. That's why it says, and we have it in our program, that when they put him in the tomb, there was Caesar's seal on it. Why? Because if you broke the seal unlawfully, you have committed a crime against Rome and against Caesar, and it would result in capital punishment. <laughs> Everyone would be in jeopardy. So they bribe them, the Bible says in verses 11 through 15. They take money and they bribe them. See, that's what the same people did to get Judas to get Jesus to be dead. And now to keep Jesus dead, they bribe the soldiers. That's what's behind the story of man. It was a purposeful deception. They purposely went the other way. I read this story and I thought this. If they really thought that the soldiers came and told them, because verse 11 says they reported everything that happened. They told them everything. How the angels came, they saw them, how they fell down, and the body was gone. They said the exact same story to the leaders, and they don't care. 
They don't want to hear the story. They had never believed Jesus was Messiah. But wouldn't you think if the soldiers told you what happened that you might even consider changing your mind? Not at all. Why? Why is it that you come and you've been at church and you're here at Easter and you've heard the story? You've seen the story. But you still don't believe. You deny it. Can I say it nicely? It's not accidental. You know why they didn't want to believe the story? Even all the facts were right there in front of their face. In fact, they had to make up a lie to counteract it. Why? Because they had too much to lose if Jesus was alive. If Jesus was alive, they would lose all their money, their power, their position, and they feared losing it all. And so the religious leaders come up to them and say this, don't worry, we'll talk to Pilate. Listen, and we will make you secure, it says. Because it's two stories of security. The security from death or the security through death. You have to decide which one you will live your life upon. God's salvation and protection through Jesus, it won't keep you from dying physically, but it will keep you from dying eternally. And they chose the temporary one, not the eternal one. Jesus said this, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake in the gospel, the same will save it. You see, if you choose to have Jesus in your life, I will be honest with you, there's a lot of things that you can lose. Maybe your friends, maybe some relationships, maybe respect, maybe even your job, who knows? But see, most people think this, my life is better, my life will be easier if I just believe that he is still dead. See, I can call the shots if he's dead. I can decide what is true and false in my life. I can control my life quakes. I can write my own story. I can interpret the things in my life the way that I want to because I'm in control. The Jewish leaders and the soldiers, they didn't want to face the reality of the possibility of a risen Christ because of the implications for their lives. And maybe you're here this morning and you said, you know what, I know the story, but I never have really believed it because if I did, this would have to change and that would have to change and this would have to be different. And I'm not ready to lose any of those things. See, we've all come this morning to a divergence in the road. We've all come and have been faced with two stories, God's man's and the story that you choose to live in will make all the difference which story will you choose to listen to and live in let's pray with every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around when I was growing up Two friends of mine in eighth grade, Mike Armstrong and Troy Brett Best. They were good friends of mine. They weren't believers. I went to public school. They were very popular. I wasn't. So I liked to hang around with them when they let me. One day they asked me if I would go down and canoe with them down the river in our town. And I said, absolutely. I didn't realize that day would be their last day. I couldn't go with them. I had to actually go back on my acceptance of the canoe ride that day because I had a dentist appointment of all things. But when I was on my way to the dentist office, as my mom drove me in the van, we went down River Road and we saw Troy and Mike getting in. The guy that was supposed to take my place was standing on the side and later on I found out that he decided at the last minute not to get in. The water was so high from a huge rain that there's a brief, or I should say, the small dam in our town, which is about a six-foot drop-off, was only about two-foot drop-off because the water had risen so high and was so strong. All the warnings and all the things that were placed on the edge of the water, they did not listen to them. They took the canoe, went over the dam, and when they do, the power of suction drew them completely to the point where the canoe bent like a V, Mike Armstrong 
was sucked down to the bottom of the entire river within instants. He got caught under a tree that had been put in there. He never came up. Mike Armstrong, I should say Troy Best, fought and fought until the two firemen got there and went on the little boat and tried to rescue him. And when he was pulling, pulling him up into the boat, by accident, he pulled the boat over and him and both the firemen also drowned. On that day, which was the day after my birthday, I realized this, that death comes for all of us, even eighth graders. It is the greatest life quake you will ever face. It is a level 10. The question is, are you ready to face it? Are you prepared for it? The answer can only be yes, if you know Jesus. He's conquered it. He's conquered that life quake. That's his story. Man has no story like that. It's only built on lies. Perhaps you're here this morning. You say, Pastor Walker, I know the story. I know the facts. But I've never had the faith. I've never put my trust in Christ. I've never believed it. But today, God's spirit is working in me. And, and I hear that story. And I understand that that story, God's story, is the true one, the right one. The false story, the lies. I understand the difference. I've been living in that other story. I've been calling the shots. I've been in charge. But today, I want to surrender my life to Christ. Yes, yes, because I don't want to die without him. But more than importantly, I want to live for him and be with him for eternity. See, he died and rose again on the cross so that he could conquer your sin, conquer your death, and change your life from the inside out for eternity starting today if you'll put your trust in him. Not yourself, not your church, not your good works, not any of those things, but in him alone for your forgiveness. If you'll repent of your sins, Jesus says, you can be in my story. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, would you say to Pastor Walker, pray for me this morning. I need to live in Jesus' story. I want to. I want to put my faith and trust in him. Have him take control of my life. Forgive my sins. I believe he died and rose again to pay for my sins. And I want to trust him and give my life to him. Pray for me, Pastor Walker. Would you do that with no one looking? Just slip your hand up and put it back down. Would you do that? Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Thank you. I see your hand in the balcony and your hand as well. Anyone else? Thank you. I see your hand, sir. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. I, pre I see your hand as well. Main floor or balcony, either one. Thank you. I see your hand in the back. Yes, I see your hand, sir, as well. Anyone else? Anyone else? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, we're going to have a closing song. I have a track up front I'd like to share with you, or anyone can come, but especially if you raised your hand. I'd like to share out the good news, how you can know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I'll be here after the service is over today. If you'd like to talk with someone to cry, trust in Christ as your Savior, you can do that. Just come up after the service is over. I'll be glad to meet with you and talk with you about how you can have a place in God's story. Father, we love you. Thank you for Jesus who died and rose again. That's the story that makes sense of all other stories. That's the story that you designed for every human being to live in. I pray particularly today for those who raised their hand just a moment ago. You've seen them all. More importantly, you see their hearts. Oh, God, help them to humble themselves today. Submit to your divine power and authority that you might forgive their sins as they repent of them. And as they put their trust in you, Lord, you might change everything. Make all the difference in their lives this morning, both now and for eternity. And we'll thank you for those rich blessings in Christ's name. Amen.